Good morning, sir. Paul, where have you been my whole life? Uh, out to lunch, actually. <laughs> I hope it was a good one. Yeah, it was actually. I didn't miss you at all. <laughs> are you? Are we doing? Are you doing video? Are we just doing audio? No, video. We want to do video. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I. I. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right, there we go. Ah, excellent. All right. Hey, Paul, what's up, man? Hey, everything is up, and uh, I'm up for you, and uh, let's get rolling. Let's go. So first and foremost, thank you for taking a minute out for the for the program. And I'm going to start off with the heavy here. The last three years on planet Earth has been quite a thing. It's worked on all of us in its own way with COVID. How did you survive it, and how has it changed the way that you do things now? I survived it very easily. In fact, because I'm an author, I spend an awful lot of time in isolation, and uh, which means I work from my home. So I never had to leave. I never had to go anywhere. Yeah. So it really had no effect on me at all. And uh, so I'm thankful and grateful for that. So you've had an interesting run here on planet Earth. There's so many parts of you that are really fascinating. And <laughs> <laughs> And we're going to take that onion and we're just going to start peeling off layers and hope we don't cry. So, uh. <laughs> so let's do this first and foremost. Let's get to the crux of who you are and what you do. I'm going to hypothetically put you in front of a bunch of third graders. Career day. A third grader looks up and says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? Great question. And basically what I do is I create a lot of videos for teenagers so that I can convince them that their lives have value right now, not 20 years from now, but right now. And they can see proof of it by watching the videos that I create for them that are based on true stories from America's past. So if you were to have a dream tonight and run into your teenage version, would you, would you listen to you right now? Of course. Okay. <laughs> I, that, that's what I thought the answer was going to be, but I just want to get real. I want to, oh, yeah. you know, oh, I see. okay. All right. And Makes sense. I, because I have two teenagers at home. I have one, I actually have a unique situation. I have, I, what's that? God bless you. You have two teenagers. <laughs> at home. So I have a, I had that, I had that experience once too, and it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think the thing that I've tried to teach myself as a parent is that at the end of the day, you have to have empathy and you have to take your brain back instead of being knee jerk and saying, I have these decades of experience. What the hell are they doing? Why don't they know any better? I'm thinking, all right, so this is what's going on. This is what's coursing through their bones. So I have a daughter, uh, stepdaughter who's 17 and she's going on 30. She's very, very mature for her age. And then I have an 18 year old who is on the autism spectrum. So I have these two very dis distinct differences, but the things that they do, whenever I really break it down, there's a lot of what they do that just pays, you know, homage to the idea that they're teenagers, you know, no matter where they are, right. they're teenagers and they're doing things that are very typical for a teenager. It's interesting. So, how did what what did you want to be when you were in the third grade? What was your dream growing up? Oh, I wanted to be a fireman. Okay. Well, you <laughs> are. You're, to... <laughs> you're putting out teenage fires. Yeah, exactly. Actually, what happened, what developed, this may sound rather uh, unusual, but uh, I went to Catholic schools all my life. And um, uh, so my dream was to be a priest. And so when I got into college, I studied theology. I majored in theology and philosophy. And, and, uh, uh, and then an unfortunate thing happened one day. I get this letter from the president of the United States. His name is Richard Nixon. And I'll never forget the opening of the statement. It says, greetings. You are hereby notified to report to your nearest draft board. <laughs> and, so, and so I get sent on a, on a Nixon scholarship to Vietnam. And just before I left, I had applied for a, 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 a spot in a divinity school here in Boston. And uh, after that Vietnam experience, I came home. I went to the divinity school for one day. And I, I was told by people all day long, go here, go there, do this, do that. And I said, wait a minute, I went through this for 13 months. 
and I ain't doing this. So I never went back. And so I spent one day at divinity school. And I can also claim that somebody once said, uh, you're now a divinity school dropout, you understand. And I said, of course I am, but I, I don't apologize for it. But from there, it was uh, whatever I could find for work is what I did. So I got into the broadcasting business as a sales rep and uh, loved it. I got trained by the King brothers who owned uh, the Wheel of Fortune and all of that. And uh, that was a lot of fun uh, dealing with those people. And then uh, from there, I uh, got into uh, broadcast consulting where I was traveling all over the Northeast and selling jingles and all that sort of stuff. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, it's too long a story. You don't want to get into all of what I do. But I ended up, I ended up uh, uh, wanting to help kids uh, because of my experience with my two sons who were teenagers um, who didn't know what they wanted to do, who were always questioning their ability to do anything because they're so inexperienced. They're just kids, just teenagers. And so they developed this uh, kind of a uh, uh, negative attitude towards themselves. Uh, the self-esteem wasn't all that great. And uh, so when I got into uh, consulting with with teenagers and, and sending them off to college by marketing them, you know, I didn't tell them to, that their test scores and their and their grades were going to be the thing that got them in the college. It was going to be everything else that the colleges don't expect. So I was, I got into marketing, uh, and I was marketing kids as like a product to the colleges. And I was very successful at it. And the kids couldn't understand why. I said, look, you know, when you apply to college, your competition is going to be so great that you're going to look like everybody else. And I always remember that statement. I don't know who said this, but the world will accommodate you uh, for fitting in, but they'll only reward you for standing out. And so that's the philosophy that I operated under all my life and i gave that philosophy to my students and as a result they were shocked that they got into the schools of their of their choice i said no you shouldn't be shocked this is the way life works you just have to know how to play it yeah. and uh and so from there uh, uh i i learned a lot from these kids who didn't have a great attitude towards themselves and these are i'm talking about a students yeah who didn't think they had this this capability and uh, so uh, it goes back to my asking my two sons who had come home from high school, and I would ask them, so how do you guys like history? And uh, the answer was always the same. Uh, Dad, it's boring. Okay, so I'd ask them that question like every six months at the kitchen table. So after about the third time, one of my sons said, hey, Dad, why do you keep asking the same question? We're going to give you the same answer. Okay, it's, it's boring. We had it. Okay. And so I jumped into my car, rushed down to the library and asked this librarian the dumbest question she had ever heard. And I said, do you have any book here that tells teenagers how great reading and learning American history is? And, and she said, what are you nuts? Of course not. There's no such book. Yeah. And that's when I had what I call my Damascus moment. And I thought, well, someone has to do this. Yeah. And uh, I like to say the rest is history. <laughs> Let's go before the letter that you got from Nixon. Let's get into your early years. Yeah. What were some of the seeds that were planted in you as a kid? Where were you born and raised? And what were some of those seeds that became who you are? You're obviously highly motivated, you know, being in the media, being out front, helping people. How did that happen? Well, I think that it, a lot of it had to do with, um, I, I wouldn't say with the way I was brought up. Um, I grew up in northern Maine, uh, which is a great place to visit if you really like the frontier in the woods, but you don't want to live there. And so, <laughs> and so I, uh, I transported myself uh, south to uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, where I spent my high school and college years. Uh, but the, uh, I, 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 I couldn't, I can't say that I had uh, a definitive way I wanted to go years ago. Uh, things kind of got accidental. I really didn't know what I wanted to do other than to use that famous expression of helping people. Well, how are you going to do that? 
and so but uh this whole college thing really fascinated me about 20 years ago and i thought boy wouldn't it be cool if i could market kids like a product uh, to a college so i did that for about 20 years and it was a lot of fun and these kids taught me a lot yeah about being a teenager and I thought to myself, wow, these kids are so talented. They don't even know that they're talented or they can't recognize that they're talented. And, and I would tell them, oh my God, you're so talented. They go, really? How do you know that? How do I know that? I just listen to you and I, I can tell. I bet your teachers tell you that too. Yeah, they do. And, but there was this kind of a peer thing where uh, we're all supposed to be depressed about how we feel about ourselves. And, uh, and I thought, this is dumb. And so I thought, how could I prove? How could I prove to them that they really are talented without listening to their friends? In other words, have a third party source. Well, I always had this interest in history. And I thought, well, you know, nobody likes to read history the way we were taught history. I mean, we grew to hate it. We didn't hate history. We just didn't like the way it was taught. And so I thought, well, listen, uh, if, if I could find a way to make history interesting, personal, meaningful, and relevant, uh, then we could, I could go to these kids and say, hey, look, you know, I've got something here that, that might work for you. And I still remember one of my sons coming home one, one day after I published my first book, uh, the first copy, and... Uh, he started reading it and he said, Hey dad, this is kind of interesting. <laughs> I said, why is that? He okay. says, well, there's these stories here that da, 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 about these guys uh, who are in this battle. And uh, I didn't tell him it was history. I just said, this is a book. It's a motivational book that will help you improve your life. Oh, dude, that's cool. And so they wanted to read it. And for my sons to tell me that my book was cool. I thought, Whoa, man, I really got onto yeah. something. And yeah. uh, and it wasn't. And it, what's fascinating, uh, Joe, is that the book was originally titled "Why well, You're Already a Leader," and uh, management types were picking it up, and and it wasn't for a mass audience, and I wasn't really getting anything out of it until I got a phone call one day from some guy from Pittsburgh. He says, "Look, I gave a copy of your book to these two teenagers at at the local high school." They really loved the content. They just thought that your title sucked. I said, oh, I said, well, what did they, did they say the title ought to be? And they said, well, it, he said, uh, they said that it should be uh, inspiration for teens. So I thought, all right, I'll go with that because uh, I'm a good listener, I think. And so I went with it and uh, sales went through the roof. I mean, parents were buying it in droves. They were writing the uh, reviews for it and i knew the kids were writing the reviews uh but it happened at the time when google had just purchased youtube for 1.7 billion dollars yeah and i called youtube i says hey what's with that you know and this guy said well, what do you do so i told him and he said well you probably really need to seriously consider getting into video because kids don't read video they prefer uh, i mean they don't read books they prefer video as their learning tool i thought uh oh I got to be where the kids are. So I got to convert my book to video. And I did that. And uh, it's really proven to be doing quite well, actually, especially with homeschoolers. Yeah, I bet. I, you know, the one thing that's very important about youth is having a good role model or hero. Who was that for you? For me personally? Yeah. God, that's a good question. A contemporary or someone in history? Anybody. Anybody that, that's kind of fueled the fire. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, I had a uh, professor in college who was the first Protestant minister to be appointed to a Roman Catholic faculty in this country. This was back in 1966. And uh, he was such an influence on me that uh, I said to my kids one day when they were teenagers i said you know the person that's really teaching you uh it's not me it's the guy that taught me while i was in college everything that i tell you is basically what he told me and so they said to me wow who is this guy <laughs> you know 
I said, oh, do you really want to meet him? <laughs> <laughs> and so is he responsible for me making your life difficult? You know? <laughs> and so, uh, no, no. But uh, it was, uh, and you wouldn't know him, but he was an advisor uh, to a famous cardinal who was a, an advisor to the Pope back in the 1960s. And I had the privilege of, of being one of his students. And he was a lifelong mentor of mine for a good 30 years. And we continued to handwrite letters to each other when we had access, you know, to, to email. That's wonderful. Yeah. So who has been one of the most interesting characters that you've run into in your time in the media? Some of that you just always enjoyed or look forward to being around or anything along those lines? Hmm. Well, that's hard to say. I've been interviewed by some interesting people like Mad Cow in Chicago. Or Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> he was yeah. here in Kansas City for a little while. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's He's been around. Yeah. And uh, it was a fun interview because when he uh, – I, I really caught him off guard at, at, at the beginning. He said, well, how are you, Mr. Temple? And I said, let me check. <laughs> and you can hear everybody in the studio laughing, you know. <laughs> he, he, he said, he says, I wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> 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 and so uh but in the media i i, I never really had uh, any uh, uh any particular admiration i i guess rush limbaugh was was a big influence on me because when i came home from vietnam uh i was a real uh anarchist you might say because i was against everything you know i just hated the way the country was going i hated the war and all that and um and of course, uh, things have changed dramatically over the years, but but I had somebody suggest that I should check in on, I said, I don't want to listen to a guy like that. And so when I started listening to him and I thought, gee, you know, there's some kind of makes sense, this guy. I don't, I don't know if I should continue listening to him or admit to the fact that I actually do listen to this guy. Uh, but I did, and I, I, I stayed with him until he died. And so that, that would be a... Uh, uh, I, I guess you pretty much confirmed all the things that I believed in in terms of what I believe in America and what America stands for and and what we ought to be doing. Uh, because right now, today, Joe, the, the problem that I have as a veteran is waking up every morning and saying to myself, God, did I risk my life for this? Yeah. I mean, and this is what 18 million uh, 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 veterans who are alive today are asking the same question. I didn't risk my life so that we could mutilate and indoctrinate our kids. Yeah. Ah, crazy. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. You know, and you're doing a lot of good work. You're inspiring the youth. You're, you know, there's a lot of things going on with you in your life. What is the daily motivator for you? What is the, the fuel for you every day to do what you do? It's a great question. And it's, it's really all about the kids. It's about the future of the country. I'm a diehard patriot. Um, and I believe in what the country stands for, and I want our kids to continue to believe in what our country stands for. And I'm, and I often like to ask the question of a lot of adults who can't answer the question. And I always ask them, what is uh, the mission of America? What is the purpose of America? And, and most people can't answer that question. And it really comes from, from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. When he says to us, like four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, what's a proposition? A proposition is a statement that we have to prove. Okay? And so our mission is to prove that statement that we are equal to each other. And by implication, that means treating each other fairly uh, every day. Yeah. That's our mission. And so that's what drives me and what that's what inspires me. If I could, if I had the ability to turn around on my computer, you could see a huge display of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address on my wall, just above my computer. It's huge. Wonderful. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, there's always proof in the pudding. Okay. And you have teenagers, they read your book. How are your boys doing? They're doing great. Uh, in fact, uh, one of them, a uh, wife had contacted my wife this morning and said, you know, uh, Mark and I would really like to take you and and Papa, I'm referred to as Papa, 
to any place you want to go, anywhere you want to travel in the, in the U.S. or outside the U.S. because he's doing really well. And and so I said, hi, oh, how about Italy? You know, and so because because my wife's Italian and uh, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary here next month. Oh, and cool. uh, so we're, we're pretty excited about those the possibility. Have you been to the old country? No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, yeah. I love it over there. I mean, yeah, it's, my it's... wife and I, uh, we, we've gone to the Sistine Chapel twice. Yeah. The first, the first time before it was renovated, uh, before the dirt was taken off, and then after the dirt was taken off the Sistine, it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. I, I stayed at a hotel by there. I was in high school, and I had a pen pal, and we wrote all the time. So I went to her little village just uh, south of uh, Florence in Castle Ferentio. And I went down one day to uh, uh, the Vatican City, and it was, I remember walking around there one night, and there was a performance that was going on. It was some Vivaldi piece and an opera singer. I've never seen anything oh. like that. It was oh. one of the first times that music brought a guttural response, and I'm like, what is this wet substance coming from my eyes? It was yeah. really cool, you know, but it was yeah. the tranquility. I'll never forget, like, walking around and just looking at the antiquity and all of those statues and the moon was kind of like a devil's hangnail and all the stars. And I'm like, wow, the history and antiquity, because you don't get that in America, that we we're 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 the teenager on the world scene, you know, yeah. and everywhere else you go, like in Rome, it's like antiquity. Like when I heard a cell phone go off in the Colosseum, I was like, my <laughs> God, the clashing of time was insane. Yeah, yeah amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so it's amazing. You know, you've accomplished a lot of things in your life. And I'm curious, what's what are you the proudest of? I would say it's what I'm doing now. Um, this morning, I woke up, for example, and I got an email uh, from a um, from a lady who had just contributed three hundred dollars uh, to my mission. And she made the statement. She says, I am so in admiration of what you do. Please don't stop. Wow. Yeah. And it's it's that it's that kind of response that I get from people that really makes my day. It keeps it keeps my my fires burning. And uh and of course with my focus on the future of the country and the future of what my grandkids are going to inherit. They have to inherit something wonderful, not something awful. Yeah. And uh, I, I just got to keep at it. I just have to do my thing. So beyond your boys, what's been one of the best success stories, fan letters you've received from your work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I remember about six months ago, uh, I got a letter in the mail. I don't often get letters. I usually get emails, right? But I get this little envelope. And I open it up, and I don't recognize the return address on it. It's from the state of Washington. And it's a little note from a 76-year-old uh, woman, a widow. And it was very short. She said, uh, I really love what you do. And she said, this is probably isn't very much, but I wanted you to have uh, at least my donation or contribution to what it is you're doing because it's really wonderful what it is you're doing i can almost quote it verbatim and uh and attached to it was a check for a hundred dollars and to me it's those little things yeah. that are big really big and uh, because we we often miss the little things you know it's, it's like uh someone asked me one day well, how do you how do you, how are you able to simplify and concretize complicated things down to what's simple? I always like to use the illustration, Joe, of, of during the fall, I'll have friends of mine come over to the house and, you know, the colors of the leaves and everything are just beautiful the time of year here in New England. And I'll ask them, I'll take them to the window and I'll say, well, what do you see? And the answer is always pretty much the same. Oh, gee, the colors are beautiful and <clears throat> the trees look really nice. No one ever says to me, I see the window. Uh, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, had it not been for the window, you wouldn't be able to see 
the beautiful colors that God has given to these trees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it's, uh, I, I always like to say, I like to discover things that are in plain sight. So when someone said to me, well, how do you make history relevant? I said, this, the answer has been in plain sight for decades. It's in stories. Mm -hmm. And we all love stories. Yeah. And, um, and and that's that's what really uh, is the thrust of everything that I do. So let's say we get off of this interview. The doorbell rings. You go to the door and there's a DeLorean and you can go anywhere in American history and witness an event firsthand. Where are you going to go? What would you love to have seen happen before your eyes? Oh, I would love to go to the to the uh, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787 uh, and see how these guys were fighting each other and arguing with each other and cursing each other and hammering out the details of what this Constitution was going to be because it was really a raucous time. Yeah. <laughs> and I would have loved to have seen uh, uh, John Adams sitting there by people uh, making fun of him because he wanted to call the, the president, uh, Washington, uh, your majesty. And of course he was rather, he was rather fat at the time. And so they, they teased him by calling him your rotundity. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Adams, your rotundity. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I would have loved to have been as, in, in that situation. Of course, there's so many others, but yeah, uh, that would be my my first first choice. So as an architect of change and all of the things that you do, let's get behind. Let's find out who the man behind the microphone is. Everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, readers, uh, fans, anybody. But you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Oh, what a great question. I've never asked that question. <laughs> Terrible. I wish you had an answer. No. <laughs> this is the therapy <laughs> question. It's for yeah, free. Yeah, exactly. Where's the couch? That's right. right. <laughs> the, uh, I would have to say that uh, uh, people look at me as a uh, as an old man uh, who is really dedicated to his country. And uh, uh, would consider me a, a real patriot, someone who's really concerned about the kids. And, uh, and, and that's my life. That's my mission. And, and, and people know, people who know me will tell you that that is Paul's mission in life is to really make an impact on how the future of this country is going to turn out, is going to develop. And it starts with the kids, because right now we're being told through the media how the woke crowd is going after the kids. That's their target. And, uh, and I'm offering a, an offset of, of that indoctrination stuff so that when people go on to my website, uh, they can go on to a little tab at the top of the page that says reward. And it takes you right to the page where you can make a contribution. And it says, please help defend our kids against critical race theory and gender theory. And that's uh, that's how I think people really perceive me as someone who really likes working with the kids. And a, a lot of my students used to call me, um, hey, this is uh, Mr. Hemphill, the oldest teenager in America. You know? <laughs> and, and so it stuck with me all, this, all these years. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a fun ride. It continues to be a fun ride, but a very serious one. I think the beauty of what you do, and it's almost like the window metaphor, like the window is the fact that you're not retiring. You're going to keep doing this. And there's something to be said about longevity. And there's something to be said about when you find something that you love, you don't really feel like you want to retire. It's a lifelong endeavor. Exactly. And it's what you love that makes you good at what you do. Exactly. And yeah. uh, and so I'm not surprised, and this this has nothing to do with ego, but I'm not surprised when people say to me, "Boy, that was a great video you did." And, and the reason why it was a great video is because I really worked hard at it, and I loved doing it. Yeah, which yeah. is the reason why it turned out so well. Yeah. And and so now uh, I'm closed captioning all of my videos, which I had never done before, because someone told me who is an SEO expert, if you 
closed caption your videos, you'll gain an, uh, an audience by probably another 10 to 15% because 10 to 15% of our population uh, can't hear very well. Yeah. Wow. So I, I'm, I'm doing it and it's, uh, it's quite a process. It's, it's rather tedious, but I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it actually. So I'm going to add, are you a, are you a Patriots fan? Uh, you know, I'm really not, <laughs> I'm really not into sports that much. Okay. All right. I, I mean, I, I live not too far away from Patriot stadium, um, in Foxborough, mass. Um, and, uh, but I've only been to one game. And the only reason why I went to that one game was because Bob Kraft invited, uh, Vietnam veterans, uh, to come to this game, uh, on his dime didn't have to pay for it, but I, I, you know, I'm not comfortable in crowds. I, I just am not. So, uh, I mean, I'll go to a game. If, yeah. If someone says, Hey, uh, how about going to the game with me? Sure. I'll go. But, uh, people know, know me that <laughs> they won't invite me to a game because they know I hate crowds. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. I just been wanting to hear, talk to somebody that's up in the area. That's just a little bit upset with Tom Brady, <laughs> just a little yeah. sore that it all turned out. Well, my wife isn't very happy with Tom Brady. She, <laughs> she, she follows the, 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 the Patriots very, very closely. And I keep asking, say, can we talk about something else? Yeah, I mean, right. <laughs> Move know? on. Yeah. No, she, she, she's, uh, she's convinced that Tom Brady uh, really has no compass in his life. He's never had a compass in his life. He doesn't know what he stands for. He doesn't know what he thinks. Uh, he, he just goes along with the flow and the flow that he likes is football and uh, his family be damned or his future be damned. It really doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, she's got a real, uh, a real criticism of this guy that I, and, and the one thing that she said to me was, you know, this, he's probably pretty shallow as well, because uh, what does he know? What does he do? What does he say? All he knows is football. Yeah. So what do you do after football? He, and she said, this guy's going to crash someday because he's, he's going to wake up one morning and decide and, and realize he can't play football anymore. Now what? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if anyone out there wants to pick up your books, learn more about you, anything about your very rich history, where can they go? They can go to my website, which is AmericanEducationDefenders.com. And I have a store there uh, that you can go to where I have merchandise that you can purchase. But I also have what I, uh, what I call the reward page, where if you click on the reward, uh, you can make a contribution to what it is that I'm doing. And I give you something back in return, which I call a reward. It could be any, anything from a customized coffee mug to a customized shopping bag to uh, my entire uh, video inventory uh, in my book. And, uh, and I hand sign all my books, all my copies, so that you don't have to go to Amazon and pay for their freight and their shipping. And, and you don't get a signed copy with Amazon, but you do if you go directly to my website. <clears throat> Excellent. Paul, this has been great, man. Thank you for opening up. You have a wonderful story. What a, what a, what a great architect of change that we need, and we got to keep it going, man. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate you taking me on for, for this half hour, and uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. Let's keep the baton going. Absolutely. Enjoy your day, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.